Theory is History, Essays on Modes of Production and Exploitation by Javis Banaji. This is chapter three, Historical Arguments for a Logic of Deployment in Pre-Capitalist Agriculture. To the memory of Dave Rosenberg, in this essay I produce historical arguments for suspending belief in the hypothesis of discontinuity by which I mean the conception that the real or alleged differences between economic regimes and historical periods are in some sense never explicitly discussed more fundamental to their historical interpretation than the factors which they share in common. Part one challenges the notion that the different economic epochs are each characterized by a predominant type of labor relation. For example, the ancient world um, by slavery. Part two looks very rapidly at the work of some medieval historians to extract the general postulate that the agriculture of any given period is characterized by a complex and differentiated use of labor. Finally, in the concluding pages, I take up sharecropping and prominent or sorry, and permanent farm contracts, referring mainly to India. The logical next step after an essay of this sort would be to look at the issue of managerial control in agriculture. But in this paper, I have sedulously, sedulously avoided this massive subject. Part one. I shall begin with the sort of rural economy presumed by the elder Cato in the early years of the second century BC. His De Agricultura is the earliest agricultural treatise to survive in full and must have circulated widely even if improving landowners would soon have access to a translated Latin version of the monumental 28 volumes by Mago of Carthage. The permanent labor force of the farm is composed clearly of slaves subject to the authority of an estate manager cum general supervisor called the Villa Villicis, or Villicis. But the farm's supply of labor depends crucially on the buying and selling of labor power. This is obvious at the very start because one of the factors which should influence the decision of a prospective buyer is the availability of local labor. It is also evident in another way. For a middle-sized olive plantation, Cato gives us a manning ratio of 13 slaves to every 240 ugera, that is, one slave to about 11 acres. In the slave economy of the Caribbean, slave densities were at least five times higher, since the standard ratio was one slave for every two acres. The slaves are an overhead cost. To run the farm profitably thus requires close control over the level and distribution of workloads. To formalize control, Cato recommends an early version of prime cost accounting, a device which he calls ratio imperum op opera rum opera fuck opera rum that is a balance sheet concerned specifically with jobs, the requirements of labor, and the amount of work actually accomplished. With slave labor, the essential requirement is continuity. They are like the expensive fixed capital equipment of modern refineries, a form of value which demands continuous operation. The owner runs a commercial enterprise, therefore storage capacity is crucial since prices fluctuate and he must always sell at the best possible price. The hiring of labor proce proceeds in at least two distinct forms, by subcontracting jobs which require large inputs of seasonal labor so the owner does not deal directly with the workforce, and by hiring laborers on a casual or semi-permanent basis. For the subcontract, Cato even drafts a series of model agreements to give the owner the best possible terms in the bargain. The agreement specifies that the owner reserves the right to supervise the operation, e.g. the harvesting of olives, but no payment will be made unless the employees swear that nothing has been stolen, that letters must be returned in good condition, 
that the contractor will furnish the requisite number of gatherers and pickers, for example, 50 active workers, two thirds of them pickers. One of the most interesting clauses in the draft agreement is the following. No one shall form a combination for the purpose of raising the contract price for harvesting and milling olives, unless he names his associate at the time. Finally, Cato designs a bonus scheme to stimulate work effort. The use of hired labor is a standard presumption in the sort of countryside described by Cato. He has at least three terms for casual laborers, two of which refer to day laborers, while one refers to a type of wage worker who, in later periods of Italian agrarian history, were usually called <laughs> compartisipanti or centisti, that is, workers employed for a sequence of operations up to and including threshing and paid on an incentive or share basis, not sharecroppers, however. In a somewhat mysterious sentence, Cato seems to imply that landowners should, as far as possible, retain their casual labor on daily contracts, since the politor, the worker hired for a succession of operations, is included in the list, the sentence obviously cannot mean that owners should as far as possible avoid hiring the same casual workers for longer than a day. To conclude, the commercialized state economy described by Cato is based on what a recent German dissertation calls a flexible combination of different labor systems. Large reserves of free labor were available to employers in the ancient Mediterranean and there, is, <clears throat> and there is really no basis for Max Weber's supposition that such labor declined in relative importance. Weber was deeply committed to the view that slave labor was the basis of classical culture and that its decline cat catastrophically hastened the evolution of a post-classical world. The idea of the predominance of a specific type of labor as the fundamental institution of an entire historical period is, of course, common to him and to Marx. Roman employers were more practical, however, and behaved not as Weberian or Weberians and Marxists expect them to, but exactly as employers tend to behave. Adapting the use of labor to the requirements and to the conditions of the local, local labor market I shall characterize this sort of behavior and its historical workings as a logic of deployment and argue that the description of this logic is more fundamental to a history of agrarian relations than the alleged peculiarities of historical mentality. mentality. A famous passage in Vero is underpinned by a logic of this sort. In the closing years of the Republic, he divided the rural labor force of the Mediterranean into two essential types, slave labor and free labor, and then subdivided free labor into three categories, impoverished family farms, hired workers, and people working under debt contracts. He then suggested with regard to these in general, this is my opinion, it is more profitable to work on wholesome lands districts infested by malaria with hired hands than with slaves and even in wholesome places it is more profitable to carry out the heavier farm operations such as the vintage or harvest with hired labor in other words in an agriculture characterized by sharp seasonal fluctuations in the demand for labor it would make no economic sense for employers to maintain large reserves of permanent farm labor whether slaves or free workers, unless they were not going to find workers at all during the peak seasons. As Peter Brunt says, it would have been wasteful to maintain slaves for industrial or commercial operations that did not provide continuous employment. Now the rationality at work here, one which determined the use of labor on hundreds of individual estates and the structure of the labor force as a whole, is what I, what, is what I have called the logic of deployment. As long as free labor existed, the ways in which landowners organized production were bound to reflect an essential flexibility 
Within the limits imposed by the availability of free labor, employers could shift back and forth between different types of, de of deployment. Yet the possibility of such reversible shifts contradicts what one might call the theory of the fixed line of evolution, whose essential idea is the notion that paid labor succeeds the other, unpaid forms of labor in a specific sequence arising out of their dissolution. Part 2. Flexibility in the use of labor has been repeatedly documented in studies of individual estates. For example, in his work on the estates of Ramsey Abbey, Raftus wrote, the account rolls reveal that workers were necessary in large numbers on the arable manors of Ramsey. Among medievalists, Postian's work was by far the most compelling contribution to a logic of deployment, drastically undermining the dogmas of evolutionism. His attack on the fixed line of evolution created enough con conviction to win over Marxists like Kosminski. Flexibility was conceded in general terms, even by the more orthodox students of manorial organization. For example, Bloch agreed. In principle, a lord had three categories of labor to draw on, and in practice used them all. He might pay laborers to work for him, he might own slaves, and he might exact services from his tenants. Kosminski, of course, was much less hesitant. A whole chapter of studies in the agrarian history of England in the 13th century is devoted to the issue of the supply of labor. It is evident that wage labor played in the 13th century countryside of it in the 13th century countryside, a very important part, far more important than historians have allowed. Generalizing from the use of paid labor on 13th century manners, Kosminski noted that here in the heart of feudal England, in its most characteristic enterprises, we usually find a combination of several forms of labor and pointed out that the agricultural treatises of the, of the 13th century noted this coexistence of several systems of labor organization. Now what Postan did was to use the more static picture of the distribution of labor services between estates and parts of the country as a basis for building a more purely historical theory of their actual evolution over time. The chronology of labor services showed why one could no longer accept the usual assumption of the gradual disappearance of labor services under the pressure of an expanding money economy. If services were disappearing with the growth of money economy, how is it that in the more backward parts of the country, farthest from great markets, above all in the Northwest, labor services were shed first, while the more pro progressive Southeast retained them longest? Postan then suggested that the crucial variable behind the pattern of distribution was the scale of operations, since this directly influenced the demand for labor. In other words, labor services vary from manner, manner to manner, and the variations reflect the differences in the relative sizes of the demesne. He then added, But if this is the true logic of the labor services, it should account not only for differences between them, but also for their evolution. Thus, the form of labor organization was decisively influenced by commercial decisions about the scale on which to operate and the possibility of doing so profitably with one type of labor or another. Behind the apparent determinisms of economic life, the inflexible evolution of whole forms of economy were countless concrete decisions about the use of labor. The increasing exactation of labor services in the great reaction of the 13th century need not, of course, imply that estates were reducing their dependence on paid labor, since the total demand for labor could increase sufficiently to allow for a growing and simultaneous employment of both types of labor. The mechanics of this de decision-making process was a subject Postan came back to only after the war in the famous essay of or the famous essay on the familists, the estate laborer in the 12th and 13th centuries, disregarding exceptional types of manners where the entire labor force might consist of wage laborers, notably the Grange manners.
On most ordinary manners, the two forms of labor were employed simultaneously. On such estates, customary services of villains and the labor of hired men were in a sense alternative. For on most of them, the landlords possessed a freedom of choice. The manner in which they in fact exercised this choice, i.e. the proportion in which they chose to employ their villains and their servants, was bound to differ from estate to estate and from year to year. Yet behind all the local and periodical vagaries of the Lord's choice, it is possible to discern a broad administrative principle. The description which then follows is crucial to a logic of deployment. Post Anne disaggregates the use of labor by groups of operations and emphasizes the peculiar requirements of each. Seasonal and discontinuous operations with large inputs of labor were sustained through the dues of customary tenants, that is, labor services. Operations which demanded continuous application throughout the season and throughout the working week required permanent functionaries. Collective and seasonal occupations like threshing and winnowing were done by hired laborers working for day wages or on peace rates. Plowing itself was, of course, a seasonal occupation, but the plowing seasons were fairly long and work during the seasons had to be as continuous as weather allowed. And for this, most estates employed a permanent nucleus of plowmen throughout the year. Posting concluded, taken as a whole, the evidence of records creates a strong impression that the use of hired labor was more general than the superficial reading of surveys might suggest. To summarize, the differentiation of types of labor depended crucially on the requirements and characteristics of the essential operations. If one can generalize this, one might say that in agriculture, the use of labor is task specific and that substitutions between types of labor, labor depend not only on the level of labor costs, but even more fundamentally, on the task composition of individual cop, uh, crops and on the actual or perceived appropriateness of particular types of labor to particular tasks. For example, a recent study of mechanization in Punjab shows that 88% of the total female labor used in improved variety wheat cultivation is deployed in harvesting, almost none in irrigation and negligible amounts in sowing and threshing. Moreover, the bulk of these women are casual laborers. On the other hand, <clears throat> on the other hand, only a minority of wheat farms actually made use of women's labor, and the total input of female labor in Punjab wheat cultivation was in fact less than 10%. When we turn to rice, the picture is dramatically different. Between 46% to 50% of the total labor time is due to female casual labor. Um, this is true of Andrea and Tamil Nadu, but not of Arissa, where the proportion is only 17% because most of the work is monopolized by males. The bulk of the labor spread between three groups of operations, sowing transplanting, weeding, and harvesting. The reaction of the estates to the commercial boom of the 13th century underlines the centrality of decisions on employment. Paid and unpaid labor were both complementary and alternative. To describe the option for one or the other as the sign of a more or less futile mentality badly underestimates the weight of purely economic reasoning in the calculations of the landowners. Let me look very rapidly at Hungary. Hungarian landlords developed their manners in three distinct phases. Phase one, the latter half of the 15th century, was characterized by the near non-existence of labor services, a limited use of hired labor and the predominance of money rents. In phase two, which started at circa 1520, landlords were, were stimulated to expand their demesnes. And Pack tells us, that the evolution of the Demesne system also led to the more or less widespread use of hired labor. <clears throat> 
Scales of production were being expanded commercially, and the landlord needed paid labor for almost every kind of work. Then, circa 1580, and in the early decades of the 17th century, in a third phase, the various forms of paid labor began to be phased down and the demand for labor met by the increasing exaction of unpaid labor services. So here is a paradigm case of the reversible shift with forced labor succeeding paid labor in a movement exactly contrary to the one expected. And of course, the expansion of labor services was rooted in a drive to reduce labor costs since redeployment converted paid into unpaid labor. In other words, the controlling influence was a purely economic rationality. In reorganizing labor to sustain bulk levels of commercial production, the landlords of Central and Eastern Europe were doing more than simply responding to the commercial incentives of Dutch capitalism. They were in the process of organizing an effective labor system with all the characteristics of a factory. The best social historian of late Prussianism, Hans Rosenberg, described it as a tight military autocratic centralized plant where workers were personally ruled by the Gutschern. Only very gradually was this patriarchal community of interests dissolved and rationalized through the extension of money wages, the mass employment of seasonal workers, the relocation of resident workforces, and the decline of share payments. These were the great developments which dominated the labor relations of Prussian agriculture in the 19th century, and which were so lucidly described by Weber in his brilliant essay on the East Albion Rural Laborers. Part three. Now I would like to suggest that to gain a true perception of the entire range of possibilities confronting agricultural employers, we should extend the logic of deployment to cover all or at least most types of tenancy. We should, as far as possible, re-examine tenancy as an aspect of the deployment of labor. In Egypt, in Justinian's time, sharecroppers standardly referred to their share of the crop usually wine, as the half share accruing to us for the work we do. That is, they saw the share they were entitled to as a form of wages. The Bengal landlords who responded to the questionnaire circulated by the Floud Commission in the 1930s consistently took the stand that their bargadars were simply wage laborers. In the North Bengal districts, where the Jotadars were quite powerful. There had already been a rapid increase in sharecropping in the early years of this century, coinciding with a movement reported elsewhere in the country, for example, in the central districts of Punjab. But the decisive evolution was the catastrophic effects of the depression in the Jute district, with the outright transfer of some 1.6 million acres of cultivated Rayadi land. In the first phase of the depression between 1930 and 1934, the annual rate of transfer in terms of the number of transfers was over 300,000. In the late 30s, over 400,000. In the early 40s, 965,000. Certainly one of the most colossal movements of land transfer in recent history. By 1939, in eastern and northern Bengal, at least 40 to 45 percent of the agricultural population worked wholly or partly as sharecroppers. Here are the responses of the various local landholders' associations. The Bargadar is not a rayat but a hired laborer, said the Bengal Landholders' Association. At first sight, it seems that Bargadars should have the occupancy right as they actually cultivate the lands but they are really glorified hired laborers, and it is not advisable to extend the right to that class. They are hired laborers and should be treated as such. The only protection he needs is that he should get the stipulated share of wages. From Birdwin, the Bargadars are practically agricultural laborers and are paid in kind by a share of the produce. From Jasori, it is highly unreasonable and, un and unwise to give the Bargadars, who are nothing but laborers, paid in kind, any statutory right. From Melda, 
They are merely laborers and they are amply remunerated. From Mimin Singh, the amending act of 1929 has not given the Bargadars any statutory right because the Bargadars are not tenants, but only hired laborers who get generally a half of the produce of the land in lieu of labor. The, land holder, the landholders also made it quite plain what would happen if occupancy rights were extended to the sharecroppers. The Kolna landlords were most explicit. If protection be given to burgadars by legislation, landlords and other people holding cause lands will certainly cultivate their lands by servants and a large number of burgadars will be thrown out of employment. And this, of course, is precisely what did happen. In a recent work, Rudra and Barden reported, our own surveys have yielded unquestionable evidence that tenancy is on the decline almost everywhere in the state. The decline of tenancy is being caused by large-scale eviction of tenants. In about 80% of the villages, tenant cultivation is being transformed into self-cultivation with the help of hired laborers through forceful eviction of tenants. So the Jatadars recently did enforce, or certainly did enforce their threats in the middle and late 70s when this survey was conducted to contrapose a landlord-tenant relationship to an employer-labor relationship, as one writer has done in noting the progressive abandonment of sharecropping in West Bengal, is certainly misleading. It underestimates the economic rationality of the Jatadars, whose reasons for using Adyars and other sorts of sharecroppers were of course linked to rational considerations of profitability. As the Pekar Gange landholders told the commission, day laborers will not cultivate the land with the amount of interest and diligence with which a bargadar cultivates, and the result will be a reduction in the outturn of crops. Landowners agreed that it was more profitable to employ sharecroppers. Cultivation by paid servants is scarcely profitable nowadays. In short, while landowners might abandon sharecropping for political reasons, the decision to retain or extend it was primarily economic. Let me turn to another sort of labor contract. Describing conditions in Burbam District circa 1910, O'Malley wrote in the District Gazetteer. There's a large class of field laborers who are permanent servants of the cultivators, being employed by the year to cultivate the fields and receiving in, in return one third of the produce. During the year before the crop ripens, these laborers live on advances of grain given by the cultivator, which are deducted with 25% interest from their share of the crop at harvest time. In the village of Sooner in Ferozpur district in the 1930s, the Siri is engaged by the landowners for the year and is given his daily food at the landowner's home and a share of the total grain produced. To induce a man to become a Siri, he is given an advance by his employer, which is made generally without interest. Finally, take an extract from one of the numerous settlement reports of the late 20th century from Fletcher, a revenue official employed in the Kendesh Collectorate in the 1880s. It is a very common practice among the larger landholders. It is a very common practice among the larger landholders to hire their farm laborers by the year. And from RS 50 to 55 is the usual sum paid, not unusually in advance. No clothes or food are provided in the agreement, but it is common for the employer to advance grain up to the amount of one big map, about 10 bushels during the year, to be paid for without interest out of the next year's wages. I have chosen to juxtapose these passages deliberately because the juxtaposition shows that indebtedness was an inessential feature of the relationship described by this, I do not mean that laborers were not often or even generally forced into debt, but that these were forms of wage labor in which labor was recruited through an advance of wages. And it was purely incidental 
whether the employer chose to confer on these advances, the fictitious appearance of a loan, since, strictly speaking, no loan was involved here. Treating wage advances as consumption loans was simply a way of manipulating effort standards. Thus, bondage and wage labor are not contrasting systems, but only simply the most reified form of the other. If you like, in bondage, the slavery inherent in wage labor is posited as such. In bonded labor, not only are wages conceived as loans, but these so-called loans are advanced on the security of the worker's labor capacity. He mortgages his labor. So a double mystification is involved. Labor mortgaging was widespread in 19th century India. The Thana District Gazetteer refers to contracts ranging from 5 to 12 or even 15 years. The Nasik District Gazetteer tells us that suits are occasionally brought to enforce the terms of the contract, but the courts refuse to take cognizance of such agreements. Permanent farm labor has been in decline for over a century now. To conclude, overall shifts in this composition of the labor force are, are best regarded as reflecting changes in hiring practices. But these ground level shifts in the deployment of agricultural labor movements between different sorts of contracts and categories of labor have less to do with the alleged pre-capitalist inefficiency, inefficiencies of feudal or semi-feudal employers than with the general state of the labor market and of course the rationality peculiar to agricultural employers as such. That employers felt compelled to secure control over labor by using cash advances and permanent farm contracts reflects the historical conditions of the labor market in the 18th and 19th centuries. Today, the Indian agricultural labor market is massively dominated by casual workers. The decision of the Madras presidency, Murazadars, to cut back drastically on their employment of permanent farm servants, the so-called penials, and reorganized production on the strength of casual labor was caused by the extraordinary glut of labor from the depression years onwards, as Baker explains. It became ever easier to rely on the supply of casual labor to cover the workload during the peaks of the cultivation system, and this made it possible to dispense with a large number of penales who were maintained underemployed, underemployed for most of the year simply in order to ensure a labor supply at the critical times. By the mid-1930s, there were well-organized gangs of casual labor who moved up to 100 miles between different tracks in order to find work. But there was no abstract inevitability about employers' responses, for in Bengal, the same conditions and the same period produced a phenomenal rise in the employment of sharecroppers, and the transition to casual labor occurred only much later, and under the pressure of a political threat. More recently, in Gujarat, the shift to labor gangs has resulted from the spread of irrig irrigated crops and the need felt by the petadars to enforce high standards of work intensity in particular jobs. So we turn full circle, having started with Cato's enthusiastic espousal of subcontracting and his model agreements for employers using contract labor. For Bremen's Gujarat Patadars deal with labor gangs through the mediation of contractor, since the strains of personal supervision are too much for them. Bremen points out that farmers prefer to use udhad, contract jobs, when a great deal of work must be accomplished within a short time, i.e. when the tempo is faster than, than that paid for by a daily wage. The implication of this is that agriculture, like industry, is underpinned by a process of effort bargaining and that workers will do only as much as they feel they are reasonably compensated for. Finally, against the classical vision of agriculture fluctuating violently between modes of production, I have repeatedly assumed that the evolution of the categories of labor reflects decisions on employment and that these decisions express a rationality which is common to different historical periods. What we desperately need is a more complex model of the use of labor in agriculture, which can both clarify this decision-making process and explain the considerable observed
variety in the terms and conditions of labor contracts and agricultural work.